Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Disruptive Investing. Today, we talked to Mark Fraunmeyer, the CEO and founder of Arkimoto, and Shula Jaren, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Enviral Tech. Yeah, both companies in Eugene, Oregon. And this is going to be a really interesting interview because they're talking about something you're probably not expecting. You're probably expecting, oh, OK, Mark from Arkimoto, we're going to talk about three wheeled vehicles. And we barely do. We're actually going to talk about something that's a shift from that. So I think you're going to find this interview quite interesting. I want to ask kind of a personal question. What what has it been like being the leader of a company that has had to move your company forward you know, you, you've got to focus on producing vehicles and then COVID hits and all of a sudden you've got a very hands on facility. You can't just send everyone home and, hey, let's remotely build this thing from home. Uh, what was it like for you when when this hit? What did you know from a personal level, like how you're leading people, you're in charge of their safety. What did that feel like? Uh well, I, I don't think I, I think it, it just it was all it was sort of all action. I didn't have really a lot of time to feel about it. Um, but the, the the reality is, I mean, so much of the work that we do is virtual. So we were able to move a, a decent chunk of the team home. We pushed pause on production uh, until we had figured out what would be a reasonable testing regimen and see what what sort of treatments would come up. It became clear pretty early on that masks were going to be important. Um, and so when we did start back up, it was mask up, social distance, minimal number of people in the facilities, um, and then slowly ratchet up the, the testing protocol uh, to keep folks safe. But I think the other side of it for us is that, you know, the, the probably the most important advance in clean transportation that's happened in the last year is exactly what we're doing right now. This has saved us a, a, a plane flight across the country to have this conversation, that we can have this face to face. And we do this every single day. We're collaborating with team members in Florida, team members in Detroit, team members in Southern California. Um, and we've actually just, it's, it's, it's required us to rethink and reinvent our processes um, that, that, you know, first and foremost was to keep people healthy, but it's, it's actually turned out that, that we've been able to move much faster on the things that are actually important for the scaling and the venture. Shula is a fellow Eugene entrepreneur, the CEO, founder of Enviral Tech. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Shula, to kind of give the backstory on how you got into the, the environmental testing of COVID business. So thanks for having me on here. It was uh, so we sort of fell into this at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we it, my, myself and my co-founders really wanted to do something to make a difference. And um, we're all scientists by training. Um, we have been. All three of us have been working in biotech for many years. Um, I've been uh, in working in and out of startups for quite a few years as well. And, uh, and we were looking at what was going on. We were watching kind of as the um, virus was sort of rolling across the, the world coming towards the United States. And we recognized that something had to be done and that um, testing was going to be a huge, important part of being able to stop the spread. Um, and that really, the U.S. wasn't prepared at the start. And I think, you know, we now know 10 months on, we know how ill-prepared we really were um, at the start of the pandemic. And so we kind of saw that and said, well, could we do something with testing? And it turns out that one of my co-founders about 10 years ago had um, investigated using testing of building environments to detect H1N1 um, because he was very concerned about H1N1 becoming a global pandemic and he wanted to see if testing of the building environment would give him any ideas of what was going on. And in fact, he got extremely good results. Um, he was able to see H1N1 come into the building that he was in. Um, and luckily, H1N1 never became the global pan pandemic that we're now dealing with with COVID. So he kind of put that work aside. Uh, but, you know, 10, you know, fast forward 10 years to the beginning of this year. And as we were kind of looking around at what we could do, we thought that um, testing was important and that doing testing of buildings was something that we could do really easily. And we had good data to support that it would be useful. So we just, you know, kind of on sort of a, a wing and a prayer and really wanting to make an impact in people's lives. We all stopped the other things that we were doing in our lives and 
started a company and um, that's where Enviral Tech kind of was born in, in March was this idea of, of building testing. I think I want to stop you here for a second because I think yeah. to illustrate this point, if we go back to Mark for a second. So Mark met you and in, involved your company in his company. And maybe, Mark, you can tell the story of how you got involved working with EnviroTech in your company. Funny bits of backstory there. Um, uh, Shula and I are, are part of uh, a, a entrepreneur peer mentoring group called Starvups, um, which is an Oregon-based uh, accelerator scaler for early stage companies uh, that's w- where CEOs mentor each other. Um, and uh, uh, one of Shula's partners, Matt Baudet, has been in that group uh, for a long time. And so when when the pandemic started, we we I sort of tapped into the network and said, hey, are, you know, who's working on what to try and solve this pandemic problem? And we, we kind of set up a, a a number of uh, a number of local folks early on to say how can we accelerate testing and so that's really how I got first exposed to the work that they were doing in the middle part of the spring we loaded up a bunch of packages into one of the deliverators as birthday presents for Mark Wahlberg and one of those gifts was actually from Enviral Tech um, that would be uh, something that he could use at one of his fitness clubs and I didn't even really connect the dots there in my head. Um, until the pandemic started to really get close, it started to really spike here in Lane County um, in, in the fall and said, you know, we should be testing our facilities. So that's, it, that's when, you know, in, in November, we basically started using their solution to, to test the facilities. And what was really cool about it was the, the whole idea is that if you're testing surfaces in a building, that you're going to catch it way faster than if you're waiting until you're doing some kind of random sampling of the people, right? So we were what what we did is we we started testing the surfaces, um, and then I think on the second round, which was late November, uh, a door and a surface in the break room showed positive for COVID, and so we identified who were all the people that went through that one door in one of our facilities. We narrowed it down to twelve. All twelve uh, got test tested. And sure enough, one person who was asymptomatic tested positive for COVID. Um, had we not had that surface testing, uh, it could have gone undetected for a couple of weeks. A bunch of people could have gotten sick. And so we ended up, you know, I, I think really um, it, it, it did what, uh, what, what they had, uh, what, what Shula and, and Matt had said it was going to do, which is, which is be a really good early detection system for COVID that let us potentially prevent a much larger outbreak uh, at Arkhamoto. Wow. Yeah. I mean, talk about forward thinking there, because like you said, you would have had, I mean, asymptomatic cases means that you just don't even know that that person has it. So you would have had no reason to even think to test them. Like you said, even if you are testing all your employees, it's expensive and it takes a long time to get results. Going back to Shula, how does it work when you go into a company like Arkhamoto? Um, how do you test their services? I want to um, kind of reemphasize what Mark just said, because one of the things that we so when we started out, we um, immediately went into long term care facilities and to to demonstrate whether or not this was going to be useful. And the story that he just told is a story that we have experienced over and over again this year where um, one of those facilities would have an asymptomatic carrier. They wouldn't know it. We would find it on the surfaces and they would be able to turn around identify that person and remove them from their facilities and therefore stop the spread in their facilities. So this is, you know, his story is definitely not unique um, for what we've experienced this year with the all of the clients that we've had. It's really simple. So the way it works, um, we have developed a special kit that we send out to our customers. Um, it's super easy to use. It comes with um, some special swabs that you use to collect samples off of surfaces. Those swabs get sent back to our facility, which is Eugene. Um, we include an overnight FedEx shipper with our kit. So it comes back as quickly as it can back to our facility in Eugene. And um, and then we test it in using the um, the same basic technology that's used for the diagnostic test, which is called qPCR super sensitive, super specific. It's the gold standard for this type of testing. Um, and, and we return results. In most cases, we return results within 12 hours of, the, of it being received by our lab. Uh, we guarantee 24 hours, but that's, uh, we, 
we know how important it is to get results back super quick. Um, and as Mark can attest, uh, we try to to get those results back to people as quickly as possible so that they can take action, which is really important. I, I was just picturing that you had to send in a team of, you know, uh, robed experts or whatever. But what's really interesting to me is that that's exactly what you don't want to be doing during a pandemic is all that manpower and all that um, suiting up and stuff like that. It just creates more problems. You're able to actually just have uh, people at Mark's company or at a facility do the swabbing themselves. Yeah, it's it's really simple. Um, we've tried to make it as simple as possible. And in fact, it comes in a small little box. It kind of looks like a 23 and me box. Um, instructions are inside. Uh, we've we've found that it's we've had um, very good success with with all of our customers. And the other point I just want to make is that um, the testing I kind of thought back in, say, April was, OK, we'll be so good at this in a couple months. The whole country is just the whole world is going to be great at testing. It'll be everywhere on every street corner. And I've been surprised to see that it's still difficult. If you try and find a testing location, it's hard to find. They're usually booked. It's expensive. It takes forever to get your results back. Sometimes you get there and they're like, no, we can't test you. You have to have a letter from a doctor. So like, it's almost been impossible for a lot of people to get tested, which means that if you're trying to keep on top of this at a college or at a business, you can't test people. Whereas this sounds really good. Um, early on, we were putting a, a lot of pressure on the the local folks to just say, "Hey, you guys need to set up the supply chain, the testing locations. You got the the idea that a doctor needs to sign a note for you to get a test in the middle of a pandemic is utterly absurd, utterly absurd. Um, and so, you know, we with the crazy thing is we found uh, this the the COVID on the surfaces in like twelve hours. That was how quick uh, uh, Enviral Tech turned them around. It took us a week to get the test results for the people on the team, um, and so 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 that was a, a you know another another big learn. There, there there are these amazing accomplishments that folks have made during this time, uh, and then there's still some giant gaps in the the full plan to deal with the whole pandemic um, that that are just uh, glaring and atrocious and have caused massive suffering. I think people watching right now are going to wonder, OK, wow, how can I, first of all, get a hold of this test? Uh, how expensive is it? And is it scalable? Is it the kind of thing where it's you know, going to take years to scale up? So is is that possible to answer those questions, Shula? Yeah, so we um, we do most of our work B2B. So for businesses that are looking sort of like Mark's business that, that want to um, have, an, have visibility to what's going on in their facility, help protect the people in their facility and protect their businesses because I think a lot of businesses end up having to shut down if they have an outbreak. Um, and so we really are looking at how do we help kind of get people back into the office space um, and keep our economy running along. Uh, we we have a service that we set up. It's a weekly service. Um, you test uh, once a week. And for a monthly um, testing, it's somewhere between $500 and $1,000, depending on um the size of your building, what type of product you choose to, to buy from us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. And in terms of scalability, um, we have, we are putting together a network of uh, labs across the country that can do this type of work. And, um, and so we, we believe we have uh, maybe not infinite scalability, but pretty, pretty large scalability. And so what's the difference between if you wanted to, say, test everyone in a particular facility? So, I mean, that could be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 people up to hundreds uh, of people in a particular building. Let's say best case scenario, there's, you know, 25 people that you'd need to test perhaps weekly in order to try and catch um, any spread from happening. How much more expensive would that be? It's it's a huge economic burden. It's also time consuming and invasive to do um, human testing. Definitely um, not to knock it at all. Human testing is extremely important and these things work hand in hand. But if you've got 25 people and you want to test them weekly, it costs somewhere somewhere around $100 a person right now to do the human diagnostic test. So that's $2,500 a week to test your people weekly. You have to gather them them together. You have to have a doctor sign off on it. Um, if you're lucky, you can get the spit test. If you're not lucky, you have to do the nasopharyngeal test, which is unpleasant. So it's 
it's a it's a burden. And you can imagine 25 people might be doable. If you get to 100 people in your facility and you're trying to test 100 people weekly, that can be just um, just really difficult and, and a huge economic burden. This sounds perfect for schools, both uh, you know elementary and high schools, all the way up to colleges, because you've got large groups of people meeting in a relatively small space, and we want our kids to go back to school if possible. And yet, mm-hmm. it's really hard to trace and to track, and we can't. You know, it doesn't seem like any school district that I've heard of is doing regular testing, other than you know maybe some colleges that can afford it. So it seems like this would work really well. Uh, do you think that this would scale for a school? No, oh, I think it's. It's really great for a school. We're actually talking with a couple of school districts right now who are interested in deploying it. I mean, what you said is spot on. The The test itself, I like to think of it as akin to like a pooled test because a single test gives you information about everybody that's in the space. Um, and just like what Mark was saying, how they used it to, to kind of narrow in on 12 people who would have had contact with those surfaces, um, it's the same for a school. So you can test, you know, oftentimes our our kids and the students are going into a single classroom. They're there most of the day. So if you test that classroom, you already have your group of people that you know, um, potentially, if, if there's a positive there, it's one of going to be one of them in that classroom. Um, and so it's, it's an ideal situation for this type of testing. And, and I think that, um, it would be super helpful. I would love to see my kids get back to into school at some point. Uh, yeah, so we're 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 actively working with some um, school districts to see how to roll it out for them. And so, in the case of Arkimoto, you were able to catch a asymptomatic carrier. Um, so someone who didn't display any symptoms of uh, COVID-19, they didn't uh, feel like they were sick, um, but yet they were were carrying the virus and were able to they they could have infected other people if. You know, if you were doing, say, the weekly tests, you probably would have caught something like this, uh, obviously mm-hmm. at a much higher cost. Um, but if you're kind of going along with, well, if you have symptoms, you should, you know, stay home and get tested. Asymptomatic carriers are going to f- slip right through those cracks. Um, and so do you think that this is a little bit of a tighter net uh, to kind of catch outbreaks before they can happen by testing surfaces as opposed to uh, just relying on people to kind of self-report? I mean, I think that all of this, these testing modalities go hand in hand. So, sur- you know, surface testing is a form of surveillance testing. You could do the surveillance testing by testing every single person all the time as well. That would be a different way to do surveillance testing. Um, you know, one could argue that if you could test everybody all the time, then you'd have a direct connection to who it is immediately. Um, but definitely surface testing in our experience has been a way to do that surveillance testing in a much more affordable, manageable format that can be deployed more broadly than having to try to test every single person all the time. Um, so yes, I, I do, I, you know, we, we look at it the way we deploy it is as a um, security net, as a, as a way to get visibility to something that you can't see any other way. And asymptomatic carriers are a huge problem for um, the spread of this disease. And that's, you know, that in, in many ways, that's how it's being spread is somebody is carrying it, they're shedding virus, they don't know it. Um, people, once they get sick, they tend to stay home because they're sick. So it's that whole period before they're sick. That's the problem. I don't mean to put you on the spot because you're not a politician. This is kind of a political question. But why don't you think uh, governments have been able to introduce this solution before? Like I like I said before, I kind of thought a couple months into this, we'd have the best experts in the world who would figure this out and be like, OK, we're implementing kind of what you're talking about now, this strategy. And yet I have not heard about it. Um, I'm definitely not a politician. <laughs> um, and I really I, I couldn't speak to it. Perhaps Mark could um <laughs> comment on that the challenge that we've had is that we've not had a cohesive uh uh plan uh, a, co- a cohesive plan of attack that's been uh steadily pursued throughout the process um and and so we've got some there have been some some real accomplishments the speed at which uh vaccines have been developed is is certainly unprecedented as far as i'm aware but the the the, the system-wide push. It's sort of like everybody's been pointing at everybody else instead of saying, 
well, you know what, even just here, we're going to get it right here. It's always been, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the issue with uh, the governor or with the president or with whoever it's in. And so, you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of us have been just sort of um, left to fend for ourselves. I mean, what that's meant for Arkimoto is we've just taken every possible precaution that we can uh, to keep our team healthy and safe. But it's, you know, when, when you look out at the broader community, I mean, there's, there's some real impacts that are happening um, very close to home. And, and so it's, it's, I, I think what we clearly need is, and, and part of this comes down to honestly, just the level of, of partisan rancor that, that is happening in our government. We have a, a government that is not functional, um, that does not work for the good of the order most of the time. It's all horse trading and uh, you know, just, just talking to folks who are in DC right now saying, you know, this is the worst that it has ever been uh, that anyone can remember in terms of just uh, the, 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 the really bitter fighting that's happening between folks on various sides of the aisles. And every, we're all just getting screwed at, at the end of the day uh, because of that, because of that, what is really a failure of our political system. And I honestly don't even blame the people involved. I think we have it. We at, at, at the root that, that I've been digging away at for a long time is the way that we cast our votes. We, the way that we cast our votes creates this positive feedback loop of separation. And it all comes back to plurality voting. It's something that we've, we've absolutely got to fix as well if we want to have a functional government. Um, but I would, I would say, I mean, all you got to do is look at, there was, a, there was a hearing recently, and I'm not going to use the I word so that this, uh, so this video doesn't get flagged by somebody in the social media realm, but I would encourage, I mean, maybe you can have a link to it in the comments. If you just watch this hearing, and I would actually encourage absolutely everyone to watch uh, the reason I'm uh, a little bleary eyed right now is because I stayed up till 420 in the morning watching the whole hearing. It's an hour and 50 minutes long. And it's just, it's, it's absolutely eye opening because one, you get to see the partisan garbage that happens right at the outset. And then you have doctor after doctor after doctor who these are frontline workers who have, have been up to their elbows in the blood of patients for months saying, screaming from the top of their lungs, practically saying, look at what we have discovered about proper ways to care. Not, not just you know, a vaccine that's going to show up in two to five months, but what can we do right now that's readily available that can be deployed? Look at the data, look at the data, look at the data. Um, and you know, you've got media that's asleep at the wheel. Uh, if you look at the, at the actual news reports of that hearing from the New York Times, from the AP, they do not match the content of the hearing. It has very real impact on what happens next week, what happens next month, the, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of people that are projected to die if we just sit around waiting for a vaccine to show up. Not that we shouldn't take the vaccine. I mean, everyone should take the vaccine, but I haven't been given the opportunity yet. Uh, and yet there's a, there's a treatment regimen that looks like it's got uh, the, the, the potential to dramatically reduce harm. This is what's really interesting to me is uh, both of your minds, you are both problem solvers. And so even though both of you did not start out to even look at this problem, right? Mark, you're focusing on a three-wheeled electric vehicle. Um, Shula, you're working on some completely different area of science. But when this problem arose, you both said, this is a problem I need to address. And I'm really curious as to why you didn't just stick to your lane, why you didn't just say, hey, I'm a three-wheeled electric comp you know, vehicle company. I'm just going to stick to that. Uh, why did you, Mark, even bother to look into this? Well, as, as you know, I, I went to, I, I only got into the vehicle business because I wanted to be a customer. And I was surprised that no one had come up with a solution that I thought was going to be ultimately practical and environmentally responsible. So that's the only reason I started Arkimoto is because the market was not providing. The people who should have been solving that problem were busy doing other things. Um, and when it comes to why, why work on this, well, you know, it turns out that the critical fundamental to the building and scaling of Arkimoto is the health and the safety of our team. We don't have expendable members of the team. We are all absolutely critical uh, for the success of the venture. And so in, in, when I was out there looking like seeing this wave uh, crashing over all of us, um, it, it was like, well, we got to figure out a way to keep us safe and healthy or else we're not going to have an Arkimoto to move forward. 
Talk to me about first principles, because we talk about this all the time in terms of what Elon says about first principles, but he says pretty much the same thing. So I'd like to hear it from a different perspective, because what it sounds like you both did is you went back to first principles. You heard other people say, like, this can't be done or, you know, there's no solution to this. But you said, I think, uh, no, that's not true. How, how did you approach this? I mean, I so so I, I, I hear the term first principles bandied about quite a bit. Um, I. I I, I'm, I'm just not sure exactly what it means other than, you know, you, you just keep breaking down the problem and saying, if, if, if I need this, what do I need to get to in the position to do that? I mean, it, uh, it's, it's sort of like disruption theory. Uh, you know, it's, it, gets, it gets bandied about a lot, um, but disruption is really uh, building something that meets the utility threshold of a market at a much lower cost structure. Uh, I think that in this case, it was uh, just identifying what was necessary for us to, for, for our community to stay healthy, for our company to stay healthy. Um, and, you know, for my mom to stay healthy, it was like, we, we all have a lot of stake in, in the solution of this problem. Um, and, and so uh, when, when it became clear that the, that the, that the cavalry wasn't going to show up uh, and this was back in March, I was like, well, let's look around in our community and and connect with all the really smart people who are working on, uh, you know. And, and I just I called Matt uh, uh, Shula's partner because I knew he was a, a very uh, skilled biologist, and he said, oh yeah, well we're con- we're actually building a biohazard two lab right now to do testing here in Eugene. I was like, wow, there's really a a, a sense in this community of just you know roll up your sleeves and get it done. Uh, rather than than wait for help to arrive. That's a really good point, because I think when I hear Elon talk about first principles, I get a little overwhelmed. I think I have to be a physicist or I have to be, you know, super duper smart and be able to go down to the molecular level to get to that first. Where's the first principle? And what you're basically saying is uh, it sounds like is a lot of what you did was communication. You reached out to people who had strengths in areas that you didn't um, to find out what's going on. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are people out there who actually know about their areas. And I, I just it's so powerful for me to hear that you reached out to your community to find out what was going on, what you could do to help, what they needed, and you worked as a team. Well, well and, and I mean, that's, I got to say, that's the Starbucks ethos. You know, Oregon, Oregon companies just have a long history of, the reason it's called Starbucks is that we are uh, sort of perpetually undercapitalized to go after the problems that we're going after. And so what we've, what we've replaced that with a lot of the times is just good community, good communication, helping each other out when we can. Um, and, you know, I, I, I owe uh, the existence of Arkimoto in a, on a number of occasions to my peers in Starbucks who helped keep pushing it forward um, in times when I thought it was done. Uh, and so, so it's sort of a natural group of people to reach out to um, when, uh, w- when you got a pandemic at the gates. I want to go back to Shula because I think this is something as people are watching this and it's seeping into their head. I've watched so many school committee meetings, for instance, where, you know, there just aren't many tools in the toolbox. I mean, people are sitting around going, OK, well, we can put the kids further apart and then we can try and have, uh, you know, a hybrid system. But, you know, they're doing their best. But now this is exciting to me because you're introducing a tool that's not too expensive. I mean, we're already spending a lot of money to do all these other remote learning things. Um is this possible that in the next few months that if school districts are interested that they could start to implement this uh, in their st- school districts, but also businesses? Uh, is this, do you think that's feasible? Yeah, I mean, I, I sure hope so. We've been working with businesses um, and actually we have been working with a few schools for a number of months now. And um, and, I, and it's totally feasible to do to do the surface testing. Um, it's, it's way less expensive, of course. And, you know, I think to sort of echo what Mark was saying, um, you know, when we started this, it was part of, partially just very selfish too, because um, we we saw this lockdown coming. We saw that um, there were going to be issues, and we wanted to be able to keep ourselves healthy, and we wanted to keep our community healthy, um, and and we were looking at ways that we could do that as easily and quickly as possible. Um, so even from, you know, we, all of our employees, we test our building um, weekly. We test our employees' houses um, on a pretty regular basis when they go, if any of them go anywhere or 
or congregate with family members. We test their houses before we let them come back to work. Um, and it's so it's totally um, something that we believe in that has made a huge difference for us to be able to to start and and grow this company in the midst of a pandemic where we have to have people, you know, we have a lab, we have to have people go into our facility every day. Um, we don't have the luxury of having a complete remote um, workforce. So this was, this was, you know, selfish in the, in the sense of let's keep people healthy and then selfish in the sense of now we get to use it to keep our own company um, in business during all of this. And definitely um, we, we bring it out to other businesses as they are going back to work, as they are starting to bring people into their buildings um, and, and for sure for schools, like I, I, really believe that if we could be doing proactive testing of some sort in our schools, that we could get our kids back into school a lot faster. I want to ask a question about looking a little further down the road. Let's say that we get the vaccine out or that the, you know, COVID just kind of plays it plays out. Um, I'm sure that in a year or two, we're all going to be thinking, we don't want that to happen again. So we need tools in our toolbox. Is it possible that your technology could be implemented into I don't know, it may sound silly, but like, you know, a little box on my desk so that when I sit down at work, I swab my finger or I lick it or I do something and it tells me like, you know, processing, sending data off to, you know, uh, your lab and lets me know, oh, OK, you're clear or you're not. Is that something that in the future could be done at, you know, in the environment itself? Or do you think it's always going to have to be the kind of thing where we send a sample somewhere? Well, that is the dream. The dream is to to have it done on site, simple, easy, fast. Uh, and, and definitely um, one of the things that that our company is really good at, and, and, and I think you kind of touched on this maybe a little bit with first principles, is really looking out there at what technology already exists and then redeploying it in a way that actually benefits us um, in a you know, something, some different way. Um, and since we're all scientists, we we're always reading scientific literature, looking at um, universities for what new technologies they're, they're coming out of labs there. And that's, the idea is for sure, um, pulling in some new technologies that will help us get to exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, having that on site immediate answer, because, um, COVID is not going away, by the way, you know, COVID is going to be with us for a long time, it may not be um, as big of an, a problem, you know, we might have a vaccine, we might have to have new vaccines every year. Um, it looks like there are uh, mutations that are happening in, in the um, viral RNA that we'll have to probably deal with in some way or shape or form. So um, we're stuck with this, just like we're stuck with influenza. Um, and influenza has been killing uh, 35 to 65,000 people every year for years. And um, we've just accepted it. I don't think we're going to accept that anymore. And and as new viruses emerge, we're going to want to know what they are, where they are, and and feel like we're protected from them. So, um, so the nice thing about the technology that we use is it's really versatile. In the lab, it's very versatile. So we can test as a new virus emerges, we can quickly um, bring on a new test, test for that particular virus. Uh, that's the good thing for the lab based test. Uh, but, you know, ideally, it would be so simple that you would have your little box on your desk. And, um, and you know, I kind of, I, I sometimes joke about having the smoke detector. Um, so you have a viral detector in your, in your building, and it alerts you when it detects any new virus um, in the building. And so it's, it's, testing every it's still testing everybody as they come in um, and then you get that early warning from that piece of equipment so yeah wow. ultimately i think that we're i think we'll get there it might take a few years fantastic i'm excited now i just want to ask like shula do you think that if this video you know starts getting shared and you start getting calls are you gonna is this the kind of thing you can scale up like if you know I mean, I'm not tooting our own horn, but the fact that I have not heard of this and I, I feel like this is the kind of thing that people want to share. Um, I know that I'm very frustrated in my community that there's just no other tools. So I feel like people are going to be calling you. Um, I, can you handle volume if people do start calling you? 
Absolutely. Yeah. The way we have built out our operations, it's um, flexible and scalable. So, and as I said, we're, we're also um, bringing in some partner labs so that we have, uh, so right now we service customers from across the country and we do that using FedEx. The biggest um, bottleneck for us is just the shipping because FedEx, you know, it still takes 24 hours or, you know, 12 hours, whatever it takes for that, for it to get from, Um, where they're sending it to us. So that's just a huge time sink. And so we're looking at ways we can shrink that by do by partnering with um, labs, sort of regional labs to get the tests back to um, the customers as quickly as possible. And just to questions that might come up about um, the people who have to be doing the swabbing in the business or in the in the school. I mean, it sounds like uh, you're, you'd give them an instruction sheet of, you know, what you want mm-hmm. swabbed. And it sounds fairly straightforward. I assume that it doesn't take a lot of time. Yeah, it, usually, I mean, I don't know, Mark, maybe you have some experience, but we hear it's somewhere between um, 10 and 20 minutes, just depending on how many swabs you're going to be using and how big of an area, like if you have to walk across a campus to swab in a couple of different areas, but the swabbing itself is very quick. Well, thank you so much for watching this episode of Disruptive Investing. I think it's important to hear from disruptors. These are two people that are obviously disruptors. And I was really curious to hear how they got to solving this problem because it wasn't a problem they even wanted to ever solve. Right. And you heard from both of them. Uh, they were both making these products for selfish reasons. Uh, Mark wants a three wheeled electric vehicle for himself, for himself. <laughs> and Shula wanted to make sure that her family and friends were going to be safe. If you accomplish a task of something that you want, you're generally talking about a market. Right. Um, so I think that that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm very interested in talking more to Enviral Tech. Um, I think that that's a tool in the toolbox that a lot of people could get into. Again, and it's very similar to uh, Market Arkimoto making a three-wheeled vehicle. That could be a great tool in the toolbox for, well, less to do with COVID, but uh, in some cases, a lot more uh, food delivery trucks, you know, for example. Both solutions that no one thought were solutions. Like we've been sitting around for months, the whole world, uh, wondering when we were gonna get a solution to COVID. And I'm not saying this is solves it, but it helps us so much. And, and no one came up with it until Shula did. I'm so glad that we get to have these conversations and I really encourage you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Hit the like button. It will, uh, you know, help share this video around. And viral tech, I mean, that's something we should all be shouting from the rooftops. It's yeah, a I mean, great idea. I think you should be sharing this video with friends and people in other school districts and, and other places uh, with hospitals and, and basically anywhere where there's people, <laughs> because this is something they need to hear about and evaluate for themselves. And a lot of times when we hear about things on the Internet, it seems like, OK, that's sketchy. But here you get to hear from the actual CEO of the company, which I think is super important. So thank you so much for supporting us on this channel. Make sure that you subscribe and like. We're going to be coming out with a lot more content on the Disruptive Investing channel.